Welcome to the Start of Grind. Well, and let me thank you for coming. You were like world traveler. Uh, who saw uh, Mark's LeWeb talk this la last week on the sharing economy? Oh, my gosh. Okay. Well, we should get you a prize. Come find me after, and I'll get you a shirt. <laughs> um, but, you know, he, uh, Mark's been traveling around the world. He's to San Francisco, to New York, and so we're so grateful to have you. And Mark, Mark is the, who's seen Mark's interview with Clayton Christensen from a few months ago? Has anybody seen that? Oh, man, this is bad. So we'll send a link out. This is an incredible interview that Mark did at our global event a few months ago. So, um, so we like to start these with just getting to know you a little bit, uh, a little bit better. Tell us, tell us about growing up in Northern California. Tell us about what your dad did, what your mom did, and, and, uh, and your family a little bit. Sure. Well, uh, for starters, I was born in Philadelphia, so oh, you were okay. Lifelong Eagles fan. If there's any of them out there, this is gonna be it's gonna be wow. our year. It's our year. <laughs> yeah. I'm an Andy Reid hater and have been for years. So uh, this is my best year in many years. Um, I grew up in Northern California. Uh, my father uh, was a doctor, a mm. pediatrician, uh, with zero interest or knowledge in business at all. Mm. He grew up in South America. Huh. So he grew up. Was in, he American or was he from? No, no. Where was he from? So he grew up in Colombia. Colombia. Uh, yeah. His native language is still Spanish. He speaks Spanish more than he speaks English. Um, his father came from Romania. Hmm. So my family's Jewish and very typical immigration story. His father left Romania at 19, had to get a fake passport in order to get out of the country. Wow. Uh, left and never went back, and left in the middle of winter and uh, got frostbite. And his entire life, I never knew this, uh, didn't have toes on, it, on one of his feet. He used to go in the swimming pool when we were little, and he used to wear sandals. Wow. And I'm like, why the fuck does this guy wear sandals in the pool? It's like the weirdest thing. But wow. he didn't want anyone to know he didn't have toes. But like... Life is so easy for our generation, and we don't know how much people struggled before us. Yeah. And, and the truth is that that struggle still exists for probably two-thirds of the world, and we're just immune from it all. And I think that struggle is going to get a lot worse uh, with climate change, so it's something to be mindful of how lucky we are. Uh, my mom grew up in the States. My mom was an entrepreneur. She was kind of my inspiration for entrepreneurship. She, uh, uh, she was originally a nurse, and then she um, did nonprofit work. She was president of the UJA in Sacramento, the United Jewish uh, Appeal, I think it was called. And then she opened a bakery, and then a second bakery, and then a restaurant. And where is this? Where did she open Sacramento. It? In Sacramento. Sacramento. Okay. And she... Um, she bought a computer because she wanted to computerize her business. Wow. Um, and so I started playing with it when I was young. It was an IBM XT. It was the first ever IBM to ship within a hard drive. It had a 10 meg hard drive. And that was like the coolest thing ever because you didn't have to swap floppy drives anymore. And I don't know why, but she bought Lotus 123 and I had learned Lotus and VisiCalc before it, and I learned how to program. Just on your own. Yeah, I learned, I oh. bought a book, and I learned how to program macros and build spreadsheets. And This is at what age? Uh, like 14. Okay. And, uh, and as a result, I got a job in a computer store in okay. high school. Uh, and before you think I was a complete nerd, um, in addition to making money, uh, selling software, which I did at 15, 16 years old, I also made money throwing keg parties. Sure. And uh, we had these vans and mobile kegs in the back, and we would go to golf courses. And, and the big decision for us was, do you have three kegs or four kegs, and do you charge $2 a head or $3 a head? And if you got too many kegs, you didn't make enough money, not enough kegs, you had a lot of angry people chasing you. Sure. And, and too many kegs, and then too many people found out. Well, no, the hope was that the police would bust the party before you actually ran out of beer, right? So <laughs> I'm not joking. <clears throat> now, you didn't, you didn't get a computer science degree in college, but you, you still coded, right? You did different projects. You, you did some things for your fraternity. Is that right? I started CompSci. Okay. Uh, CompSci in the 80s was terribly boring. <laughs> Uh, and, um, and so that, that didn't last very long. 
but I was a programmer in college. I got a job at a, um, at a bank, um, and I worked in their corporate finance group. So they had, uh, it, it was the biggest bank on the West Coast at the time. And uh, we had a finance group for all of the bank branches based in San Diego. And I wrote programs to download stuff from the mainframe so we could do analysis three days faster than they would send us the data. Wow. So I did that kind of stuff. I did programming for the Career Center at UC San Diego, um, trying to build programs for the Career Center there. Um, I don't know. I was just always dicked around with computers. So you, you, you go to UC San Diego, you graduate, you start working for Anderson at the time, which True. is now Accenture. Yeah. Um, you start traveling around Europe. Is that right? You start working for them overseas. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, so the thing is, it was 1991, and it was a terrible recession, and we had just had the savings and loan crisis, and people couldn't get jobs. Mm -hmm. And in a way, I think I was unfortunate to get a job because... I really did have these entrepreneurial skills, and there were some manufacturing companies. Am I off? Is that on? Do you still hear me? I think did I do that by your pulling socks, at my it socks? That. Uh, it's either my it's socks or my voice. It's a trick that Dan voice. puts in. He doesn't. It's, it's a All right. pet peeve. Can you hear me now? You yeah. could probably hear me without the mic. I talk pretty loud. Um, or so my wife tells me. But... Um, <laughs> You know, I, I had, there were a number of small businesses in San Diego that were producing hard drives and uh, computer assemblies and, uh, you know, a lot of stuff in the IT sector. And I had gone out to meet a bunch of them because I didn't know if I was going to get a job. So I thought I'd join. Like, you didn't join startups. And you join a startup if you couldn't get a real job. Uh, and to some extent, unfortunately, I guess I got a real job. And uh, some of my friends who were forced to go into startup companies ended up working for these biotech firms that became huge, and they made a lot of money oh. by not being able to get a job. <laughs> you've, been, you've done all right. It's so, worked out. So it was uh, 19, I, from <laughs> 91 to 94, uh, yeah. I programmed. I, okay. did, uh, I started as a programmer and then a database designer and then <laughs> a project manager, and then we did, um, you know, I led conversion teams. It was all technical. And uh, my specialty was computer networks. Hmm. And um, in, at the end of 94, most of my friends quit to join startups. And that's when startups were really starting to become a bigger deal. Yeah. By the way, this is still pre-Netscape. Pre yeah, yeah pre-internet. And uh, they mostly went to work for companies that were doing programming languages. So hmm. Smalltalk was a big object-oriented programming language. And a bunch of people from our company went to work at Smalltalk and... And they, they all went into the software industry. And I had this, um, I had this path to choose. Did I want to go do a startup where it seemed like people were going to go try to make money? And keep in mind, I always wanted to do startup stuff, even back in college. It, there was an appeal to it. Um, or did I want to move to Europe? Yeah. And I like to say I chose life. Hmm. And I don't really have regrets about that. But um, I, I only went because I wanted to live and work in Europe, no other reason. So, you, so you're working in Europe. T talk to us about when you, when you got the idea for Build One and how that, how that came to be, how you finally got, got out of the job. Yeah, for all the wrong reasons. So um, I, I went, uh, at the end of 94, I moved to France. Yeah. I moved to France because I wanted to learn Spanish. <laughs> and and uh, it's actually true. It just makes sense. It was the closest I could get to Spain. Uh, I, I, um, well, you could have gone to Spain, but... I didn't have someone who was willing to offer me a job in mm. Spain. So I had someone willing to offer me a job in France. And uh, I lived in the south of France, in Antibes okay. and in Cannes, uh, which didn't suck. It's not bad. No, yeah. it didn't suck. And uh, so my wife likes to point out I went from... Was she with you? Were you married no, no, at the time? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I went from... I didn't mean it Pretty how it sounded. <laughs> I didn't mean it how it sounded. Well, it uh, Maybe I did. So I went from... <laughs> San Diego to L.A. to Miami to the south of France to Rome. Wow. And so that didn't suck. And, um, and then I went to England. And uh, no, so really I wanted to learn Spanish because it was my dad's language. And I mm. always felt like I was never good enough at Spanish. And I thought if I could live and work in Spain, I could become bilingual. But I just never got the opportunity. Then I didn't. And then later on, I ended up getting to live in Barcelona. Uh, but then, ironically, they speak Catalan there <laughs> rather than Castilian. Um, and uh, 
I, you know, the weird thing, Derek, and I probably should let you do some speaking, but um, I was deeply technical when yeah. I went into Anderson Consulting, and I got paid much less than engineers who graduated because I graduated with a degree in economics, hmm. and they paid engineers four grand more entry point. By the way, the, the salary, which yeah, was, a yeah. was a good salary, it was a good salary. Uh, it was twenty-seven thousand dollars entry salary, and engineers were paid thirty-one to thirty-five. So that was significant. The was, engineering versus non-engineering. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of my friends were making eighteen, nineteen grand. And uh, the thing that pissed me off is I had a friend who was a cocktail waitress and had never done shit on computers, and she was paid thirty-four thousand dollars because she was an engineer. Wow. Cocktail waitress, really. Engineering degree. Engineering degree. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and wasn't even electrical. I think she was mechanical engineer. Was she serving drinks around the office? What do you mean she no, was but, a cocktail waitress? No, but like in college, I'm working in a computer store, and then I'm doing programming. She's and waiting tables. She's, no, not even waiting tables. She was a cocktail waitress. She literally was. And okay. a receptionist. And, okay. and there's nothing wrong with that. But, I mean, the, it, so there's a point I want to make here, and it's not about cocktail waitresses. Um she was paid much more than me, and no matter how technical I was, they saw me as the business guy because I graduated with a degree in economics. Right. So my goal was to transfer into the deeply technical part of Anderson Consulting so people would see me as a technologist because I love technology. And I finally got transferred, and the move to France, we had three tech centers around the world. It was, um, there was one in Silicon Valley, unsurprising, one in Chicago, and there was this group out of the south of France that served all of Europe. And uh, so then I joined this group. It was called Network Solutions. We did um, computer networking and the predecessor to the Internet. And then no matter what project I went on, suddenly I was no longer the business guy. I was like the tech geek. And I'm huh. like, but hang on a second. I was economics degree. I did all this business stuff. No, 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 Didn't no. Matter. You go in the corner with all the nerds and do the tech stuff. And then a few years later... Were they still paying you as a business guy, or did they eventually pay you as a tech guy? Well, it kind of all equals out in the okay. end. It does. Um, and then I got into uh, strategy consulting, and I wanted to go into strategy consulting, and they said, yeah, but you are a tech guy. Like, we don't take tech guys in the strategy consulting group. So I worked on that for a few years. I got them to accept me. Yeah. And they transferred me in. Probably the internet helped because they needed internet skills in, in their strategy group. And then suddenly I was a PowerPoint weenie. It was like nobody would give me any respect, and they just saw me as the guy. Oh, you're the it guy who your goes resume. and talks to the senior people to do right. PowerPoint slides. So then um, when I left Anderson, I did a startup, and, um, and that startup— This is in Europe? Yeah. You I was, stayed there. Yeah, and I'll tell you the story of how, how I did that for all the wrong reasons. But when I did my first startup, then it was like, okay, I was a startup guy. And no one could see me as anything but a startup guy. So I started a second company. And I just called myself a serial entrepreneur. I guess if you do more than one, mm -hmm. by definition, that's serial. And uh, then everyone just started calling me serial entrepreneur. So then I, when I wanted to go into venture capital, everyone said, yeah, but you can't really do that. You need to be an EIR. I said, why? <laughs> they said, well, because you're the serial you're entrepreneur. entrepreneur. Right? And so moral of my story is you make your own brand. You're never good enough. No, yeah. you make your own brand. It's like... If you want to be the marketing person or you want to be perceived as a business person or a VC or a technical person or whatever you want to be perceived, people will always define you. Hmm. And the only way to break that mold is to define yourself. And the only way to define yourself is to come up with the brand that you want to create for yourself and to always tell people that that's what you are. So when I got into venture capital, I thought, well, what could I do that's different? And I thought, I'm going to be in L.A., which I was only supposed to come for two years, and here we are seven years later, but um, I was only supposed to come for two years, or it's six years later. Uh, I was only supposed to come for two years, and um, I thought, do I want to brand myself as the L.A. guy? Yeah. And I thought, nah, that, 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 I, I want to do the best deals wherever they are, but I thought most VCs that I met didn't have very good operational experience, so I thought, well, what if I created a blog called Both Sides of the Table, and I could emphasize the fact that I used to sit on your side of the table, so... Mm -hmm. Then I just chose to brand myself as that guy. But you can create your own brand. What was the question? That was it. Can you create your own brand? Oh. I think you can. <laughs> I agree. Um, let, let, well, so we're on this subject. Let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, so you've got, you've got entrepreneurs, you've got founders who are really, a lot of them are in the, the very earliest stage 
of their startup. And we're here in LA, but you know, we've got what people all over the world watch this. So what are some of the things you can do? You're two guys in a garage, you're two guys across campus, you know, trying to make a name for yourselves. How do you define yourself? Where do you start? How do you, you know, how do, how do you figure out even what to define yourself as? Well, one thing that really matters is confidence. Uh, confidence and maybe um, a sense of purpose. And what I mean is, um, I told this story in a blog post I wrote called, Is It Time to Earn or Is It Time to Learn? I have a friend, he's probably now like 48, 49. At the time, he was 42, 43. And he said to me, Mark, I'm going to take a job as president of this startup. You know, do you think I should take the job? And I said, well, tell me about it. Like, president's kind of a weird title. Like, you're 42. Like, why are you being president of a startup? You know, is there a CEO? He said, yeah, technical founder. He wants to retain the CEO title. Hmm. And I said, that sounds pretty terrible to me. You know, you have been at five startups. You had an exit at your last company where you were the chief revenue officer. Why on earth would you go take this job as president? Hmm. He said, well... I think if I do this and I do it successfully, then VCs will back me as a CEO. Hmm. I'm like, dude, you're 42. Like, you, you know, I got guys getting funded at 23. If you're not confident enough to get funded now, you're never going to be funded. Right. Like, just forget it. Like, by the way, it's, it's no great failure to not be CEO. CEO is the most overrated job in the world. It's pretty terrible to be CEO. <laughs> uh, people just don't realize that until they do it. Um, but I said, if you really think you want to do it, like you need to be confident and tell people, I'm CEO. I'm the guy. Material. I'm no, that guy. I'm CEO material. Yeah. I'm CEO. I'm CEO. You know what? I'm CEO. And then people. Yes, you I, are. So I have a. I have a. It's I've, like it's like Jedi mind games almost. Right? I have a friend. I have a friend who wants to sell his company for $100 million. That's his goal. I have lots of friends like that. I know, but he's. <laughs> he's he's in it. Yeah. He's got a chance. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike my friend. <laughs> he sold his last company for $244 million, and he sold his previous one for 450 So this guy doesn't Decent. need to work. But, like, the company he's created, which I won't name, um, he, just, he knows it's not going to be a billion-dollar company. Yeah. And it's not worth $100 million. Uh, but he's telling everyone it's worth $100 million. And he just said, Mark, trust me. The more times I say this... Someone will buy it for hundred. This is this is to potential acquirers, or this is just to everyone. Tells everyone, it's a hundred million dollar business. You have to be confident to pull yeah. that off, and you have to message it enough, and that everyone's like, "Well, I don't know. This is the hundred million dollar business, right?" Like, I, I, I'm not joking. It's um, confidence matters, yeah, and a sense of purpose matters. And you don't have to start by saying you're a hundred million dollar business, but if you're two people working at cross campus or working in Skokie on your project, it's, you know, we're a startup company that has ambitions to do X and we want to build a big company and, you know, whatever, make our dent in the world, whatever your ambition is. Yeah, but you got to believe it. You got to own it. You don't believe it, no one else is. You got to completely, totally commit to it. And you have no reason to believe it because most likely it's not going to happen. That's right. right. you, as an entrepreneur, you have to suspend disbelief. I, I came from a board meeting to here, so that's why I wasn't here a little bit earlier. And I was saying to the CEO of the board meeting, I said, I don't know, I just have this blind belief that you guys are going to create an enormous success. Hmm. And for every time I felt hugely stressed that our burn rate was getting too high and I didn't know who else was going to fund the company, and I've already put in so much... I'm all in on this company, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, who is this again? You mentioned earlier. Can't remember. And uh, and 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 I'm all in on the company, and they're doing well. They are doing well. But the problem with being all in, if 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 all in for me, let's say I can write ten to twelve million dollars per company. If I write two million dollars and we hit a bump in the road, I can write another two million dollars. If I write nine million dollars, you hit a bump in the road. I'm pretty fucked. So, am I allowed to say this is on camera, right? Oh, we'll edit okay. it. We'll turn in fudge or something. Okay. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I'm like fudge, you know, like <laughs> it's, uh, we'll just snip that last piece out. And, uh, and uh, I don't know why, but like I suspend disbelief. I just know mm. it's going to work but out. But do We're you believe, so, so with this company, I'm going to assume you yeah. believe, you believe in this company. I do. But if you didn't believe it, would you still say it so that he would believe it? No. You wouldn't say it. You wouldn't feed him a line. No. 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 I, I wouldn't make him unconfident. 
Yeah, I would say, dude, we have some real challenges here. Like, <laughs> we, we got to. I, I say that to people. I really do. Like, you can ask. I, I just say, like, I'm I'm nervous about the direction of this company. What are we going to do to make it better? But I don't feel nervous. I guess my point, Derek, was this: um, to be a CEO, you go out and you recruit somebody, and you recruit someone from I don't know Google, Yahoo, Facebook, or the startup around the corner, and you say to them. I know you're on a career track. I know you're earning X, and I can't pay you X, but come join me. We're going to go do something special. Mm -hmm. And the minute you do that, I, I, I own your success in a bad way, meaning I'm responsible for you. I'm responsible for your career track. If I screw up and you've got this little blip that you have to explain, explain why did I work at Startup Grind for two years when it went into the ground, which, of course, it won't, it? right? You yeah. Have, you have confidence you're going to... But, but we like, will be a $100 million company, Mark. Is that it? No, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so. Sorry, there's the confidence. So I'm, I, I, need to, I need to get in the mirror tonight and work on it. There you go. <clears throat> no, but, um, but honestly, that's why it sucks being a CEO. Because I had people coming to me. Um, by the way, we're completely bouncing off walls. I think it's my lack of sleep or ADD. But um, I had a guy come to me who said... Um, I'm thinking about getting a mortgage. Do you think now is a good time? And I'm like, fudge no. It's, uh, it's a terrible Here. time. We've got three months cash, and I have no idea if we're going to raise more money. Yeah. But that's not actually what I said. So um, I said to him, listen, you know, it's a startup. Hmm. Obviously, startups never have long runways. But I feel pretty good about how we're doing. I feel good about our chances of raising more capital. If you feel it's the right thing to do, you should do it. But just know we work at a startup, right? There's risks. Yeah. And so he goes away and he gets his mortgage. And now I own, I own the responsibility for that. And I don't take that lightly. Like, you, you have knots in your stomach on a constant basis. You worry about all your staff. You worry about their reputation. You worry about your own reputation. You worry about the people who gave you money. You worry about the customers who entrusted you, you know, because everyone who said, I'm going to use Mark software, yeah, they made that decision. If I go under, then they're the putts who, you Built know. Built on top of you. Yeah. yeah. So it's a lot of, a lot of pressure. Well, and I think, too, I mean, to, to, to tie back to what you said earlier, you know, these types of, these are good types of problems. In the grand scheme of the world, you know, I, I, I think, you know, I sit, in, I sit in my garage in Palo Alto, and I think sometimes I think, Oh man, I feel so sorry for myself. And then I'm like, geez, like look, look, like what am I saying? You know, I mean, it could, my life could be so much more difficult. And hey, I have the freedom. Yeah, yeah. I may not have dental insurance, you know, or hey, I may have to continue to rent for in perpetuity. But like, these are good problems to have, and I have, you know, I have the freedom to work on what I want to work on. And I, have I the, think if you, if you haven't traveled around the world and seen how other people live, you should, if for nothing else than perspective. You know, yeah. it, it's um, humbling to spend time in India, and you spend times in some of the poorest areas. And, um, and it's, it's really surreal knowing that you get to jump on a plane and, and, and end up the next night in your own bed in wherever you live in relative uh, luxury. Yeah. And, uh, and these people don't. And they don't have that option, and that's the majority of the world. And I don't mean to depress you all, but like you should feel pretty good about what you have, and not take your stresses too seriously. I mean, it is something I've talked a lot about. I worry about like the last year there were quite a number of suicides. There, you know, there there are a lot of stressed out people in our industry, and I think we just need to take down the stress level. When this balance of that we call it work life balance, but it's not it's not necessarily balanced, right? It's not equal, but it's you've got you know, you've got to keep your head on straight. It, 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 for me, and please jump in here, I think it's probably the same for you, but I say to myself, hey, the worst thing that happens to me is I lose everything professionally, but I'm not going to lose my family, yeah. you know, and at least I'll draw the line at that point, and if it ever gets too close, I can always go back and work at electronic arts. But Derek, you know? a lot of people do lose their families, and that's the that's point. That's true. That's true. They so, lose relationships. They lose their wives, husbands, kids. You know, they end up splitting their kids, and, uh, and it's as a result of not having good work-life balance. Right. Well, and I think, and look, I you know, may have not faced hard enough challenges, but you, I think as, as entrepreneurs, we have, to, we have to make decisions. What are we going to do? You, you've talked a lot about integrity. 
in your writings and things, and you know what what's important to us, what's not, how far do we go? Um, and sometimes we push it too far, and sometimes maybe we don't push it enough, and we're yeah. not, we don't hit the success. Um, I like you've written so much that's impacted me as a founder, uh, which I I, uh, I snuck up to. You know, I used to sneak up to Steve Blank's classes at Stanford when I worked at EA, and uh, and your lecture was one that that I did that for, and uh, and and things like that have had a great impact on me. And I thought, I wondered if maybe tonight we could kind of go through this experience and kind of rapid fire hit a lot of these points that you that you've written these essays on, but just give people a taste. And then what I would challenge challenge the community here is to these different things that you're not. You know, an expert on, or you're not good at. Go back and read what Mark's written about it. We might spend, if you're okay with that, maybe we could do that. Any amount of time. You and have. and I could be. We could play me as the entrepreneur. Okay. And uh, I was going to ask the crowd if we could get a startup idea, and we will start at the beginning. As I am an entrepreneur chasing an idea. What's 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 some of the worst ideas that you could possibly think of? Let's hear one. Anybody from the crowd? Let's hear it. What do you got? What was that? MS Paint meme generator. <laughs> That is a horrible idea. You are right. Okay, what else do we got? <laughs> Anything else? What's that? Costumes for marathons. Okay. Bonsai delivery service. Okay. Okay. Let's how, about, how about if we just choose a cliche? Okay, give it to me. Uh, ride sharing. Let's go create a ride sharing. Awesome, because I had an idea for it, so it's yeah. perfect. Um, <laughs> So, Mark, I want to build a great product. I want to change the world. Yeah. I want to build a great company. I want to get you on my board okay. for my new ride-sharing service, okay. which is just amazing. Um, and it's going to be a $100 million idea, Mark. A $100 billion idea. I think you have to have a B, baby. <laughs> let, let, talk to me about some of the foundations that I need to have. Let's, let's just some of the attributes that you want me to have. Let's talk about well, why, why would I need to have tenacity? What does that mean to you? What, what do you need to see in me that would be tenacious? Well, I, I can say this, that um, uh, it's not out of arrogance. It's out of capacity. I can sit on probably eight or nine boards at a time. Sure. And um, that means I do one or two investments per year. That's right. And I see a lot. That's right. So for me, um, I'm most likely going to tell you no. And... No doesn't mean, well, sometimes no means not ever. Well, you're going to tell me no if I come to you like that. But I'm saying work, work, work me through this process of where you would say yes. So starting at the beginning, the type oh. of entrepreneur. Well, you were asking me about tenacity, so I was going to answer that okay. question, which Go is, for it. well, because almost by definition, I'm going to tell you no. And then no mm. is either not I ever see. or not now. Yep. Um, or this is kind of interesting, but I'm kind of busy. Yeah. And uh, those are pretty much my only three answers. Hmm. And then occasionally I do a deal despite myself. Hmm. And uh, I'll just say, Derek, you know, it's, it's nice, but like there's a few of these ride sharing things. I'm just not that into it. Uh, I'll probably say a nicer version of that. And um, that was pretty nice. And, and, and somehow you'll have to find a way that you're on my calendar six weeks later. And I'm like, how the fuck did Derek <laughs> get on my calendar? Like, di didn't I already see him? And then my assistant says, yeah, but he's so nice. And he gave me this nice clock. And uh, I'm like, fine, I'll see him. And then I see him. And then uh, somehow you got her to give me, give you her, my text number, my cell phone number. Cause, yeah, because I, I just had to get it. Yeah, and somehow you got it out of her. And, and uh, <laughs> I'm showing up to cross campus at a startup grind event. And you text me right before. And you say, Mark, I know how busy you're going to be. Um, but would you mind coming just 10 minutes early and meeting me in the parking lot? I just have one idea I want to show you. It really would make a difference to me. And uh, I'm like, oh, God, really? <laughs> Fine. 10 minutes won't kill me. I'm going to be there anyway. Yeah. Right? And then uh, your thing that you wanted to meet me about is you have this company you want to introduce me to where the founder you think is going to be really valuable to me. So you do the introduction, and I meet him, and that was wow, what a great meeting I had. Thank you for doing that. Now suddenly I'm like, that guy, Derek, yeah, that, that was pretty cool of him. Like, I kind of like that guy. I don't know why. I kind of like him. Seems nice enough. And, uh, and just you, you develop a pattern over time that no matter how many times I try to say no to you, I can't. Because I'm going to say no to you. 
and the guys you want to hire from Facebook are going to say no to you, and you're going to call a journalist, and they're going to say, dude, everyone's got a ride-sharing idea. I'm not interested. And then you're going to ask David Hornick to go to the lobby, and he's going to say, I don't know, i got too many guys already. And, uh, like, everyone's going to Everyone say Everyone along no the way. You. And if you don't have what it takes to accept that and keep coming back and keep coming back and keep coming back, how the hell are you going to get customers? How are you going to get employees? How are you going to get bought one day? How are you going to do biz dev deals? Like, so tenacity matters a lot. Okay. Well, I got that. Check. Um, let's, let's, talk about, let's talk about the ability to pivot. Mm -hmm. I think this is an interesting one. Um, what, what does that mean? I mean, ride sharing, this is going to be hot. I'm sure this is, this is the meal ticket, Mark. But you say you need to have the ability to pivot. Talk, talk so to me about that. I don't mean pivot in the Eric Reese. Uh, sense of the word that I launch a sticker sharing platform and then the next day I have like a place where you go to listen to music with everybody else in avatars. I don't mean that kind of pivot. I don't know if that's ever happened, but if it did, uh, if it did, that's not the kind of thing I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> what I mean is this. I believe that the best entrepreneurs make quick decisions and are decisive and don't have analysis paralysis. And the overwhelming majority of people I work with in my life can't make decisions. Mm. Everybody thinks they want to be the leader. Everyone mm. thinks it. Very few people really want to be a leader. That's interesting. It's hard. It's like you got to make decisions on a daily basis. Should we get 8,000 square feet or 6,000 square feet? Should we put it in Amazon or should we have hosting here? Should we offer a dental plan or should we not offer a dental plan? Should I raise 300K or 800K? Should I hire this person or not hire this person? Should I give them a point and a half or not give them a point mm. and a half? Should I agree to the indemnification clause or not? Should I use mm. Gunderson or not? You know, like you just like, it, it's um, you're overwhelmed with decisions. Yeah. And, and I see a lot of people who just don't, they're not good at making decisions. So I value decisiveness. I value people who can say, look, I'm never going to have more complete information than I have today. Let me make a rational, structured choice here mm. based on logic, based on intuition, based on my past experiences life, based on triangulating. I always say you need to talk to lots of people, get lots of data points and say, okay, well, I kind of heard what people think about being located in Santa Monica versus Venice, what the pros and cons are, I think I want to make this choice, right? Yeah. And, you know, honestly, I think the smartest people in the world, if you make that many decisions that quickly, are only going to be right 70% of the time. And then you see people who, once they've decided, become so dogmatic mm. and inflexible because they, they're worried that they're going to look dumb for changing their mind. Yeah. And that's what I meant by ability to pivot. Like, I'm going this way, and the data suddenly says that's not a good idea. You're like, okay, well, this no big way deal. looks good to me. Yeah. yeah, Water off the duck's back. Yeah. Humble enough to admit you're wrong, something I like that. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Um, wh why, do, why, do I need to, why do I need to have a willingness to accept risk? How, how, when you meet with founders, you know, who, wh do you just see all across the board, like this guy you mentioned with the mortgage, uh, or who wants a mortgage versus... Can I tell you another story? Please. And this is, this is really answering this question. Um, when I wanted to work in venture capital, and I, I don't know why I wanted to work in venture capital, but I thought it'd be a good idea. And uh, a lot of the VCs, I, t I was living in NorCal, a lot of the VCs there were saying, yeah, come on in, EIR. Mm. I'm like, I don't know, I kind of done that before, I want to be a VC. Okay, well, we have a principal roll open. I'm like, I don't know, I'm 39, I kind of, I sold two companies, I feel like I proved myself. Um, okay, well, you could be an operating partner, or a venture partner, and I'm like, well, what is that? Well you get to be involved with our portfolio companies after we invest. I'm like, well, I want to be a general partner. And, uh, and there weren't a lot of general partner like openings. Hmm. Um, <laughs> so I talked to my buddies at GRP, and they had funded my two companies, so I hmm. knew them. And uh, they said, what are you going to do next? I said, probably another startup. And they said, have you ever thought about being a venture capitalist? I said, yeah, thought a lot about it. Hmm. Um, I don't know if I'd be good at it. And they said, well, come on down. So I came down and I interviewed. And they're based in L.A. We're based in L.A. And uh, they sort of liked me. And the interviews went well. And they said, um, we're going to go raise another fund. Hmm. And when we raise the next fund, then we'd like to bring you on as a partner. 
like, no fucking way. Like, either it's now or it's never. Like, hmm. I'm not going to wait until you raise another fund. And my mentality was, um, once you raise a fund, then you've got all this money, and now you're like, well, let's do a do recruiting really process, it. right? Yeah. I knew it had to be now. Hmm. And frankly, I had kids by then, and I'm like, I want my kids there for the school year. And they said, well, we can't do it. I said, why? And they said, well, we don't have the fees to pay you what you want to earn because we haven't yet raised our fund. I said, I don't care. Just pay me half fees. Pay me <laughs> half what you think I want to earn, and I'll pay all my own moving costs. They said, we couldn't do that. I said, wow. what are you talking about? You can't do that. Of course you can do that. They said, well, we'd feel bad. I said, let's look at my options. <laughs> I can go. That's like the first time that phrase has ever come out of a yeah. Uh, well, I can. I can. DC's mouth, right? <laughs> what? I can't do that. I just feel bad about it. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, right? That's probably Maybe. fair. Um, <laughs> but they were asking me to be an employee, not a company that they funded and didn't want me to pay salary. Um, and I said, here's my options. My options are I can either pay myself zero or I can pay myself half of what I ultimately want to earn. Yeah. It's a no-brainer. And they're like, well, when you put it that way, I'm like, right? And uh, so I said, okay, fine. Come join. And... Uh, and they offered me a certain amount of carry. Hmm. And I talked, about it in the, I talked about it in the post that I wrote this morning. Uh, they offered me a certain amount of carry, and that carry was about a third of what a normal entry-level partner in a fund gets. Hmm. And I thought to myself, well, that's a bit low, but I don't want to fight. I just want to get in the door. And once I'm in the door, I know I can prove myself. And if I don't, then I suck anyway. But if I prove myself, hmm. then I have the right to ask for more later, which is, in fact, what happened. And, in fact, I'm now managing partners six years later. But hmm. um, back then, it was like a third of the normal entry level of wow. the most junior partner that came in. And the reason I pointed out is I had another guy who was coming out of Stanford, and he had just finished his second year, and he said, my lifelong ambition to be a VC. Hmm. I'm like, that's a pretty unfulfilled <laughs> life, but if that's your <laughs> lifelong ambition... Um, how about you come work as an intern? Huh. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, we're going to be hiring in six months. We're not hiring now. Come be an intern for three to six months. He said, well, I can't do that. Can't I said, why? He said, well, I'm finishing my second year of Stanford, not my first year. Maybe you misheard me. And I said, uh, no, 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 come. And he said, okay. Graduate and then come. Yeah, and, and by the way, this was 2009. So like. He's not getting a job anyway. You remember what 2009 yeah, was like, That's right? when I quit my job. And, uh, and so he said, I can't do it. And I said, why? And he says, well, okay, I'll make you a deal. This is him talking. He says, if I do a good job, I want you to promise me you're not going to recruit. I said, I'm not going to promise you that at all. He said, but if I do a good job, I said, no promise. You hmm. come in. And uh, he said, well, then I can't do it. I said, okay, well, fudge off. So, um, so, so he didn't take the job. And I thought to myself exactly this. If you're not confident enough in your ability to come in and knock the cover off it. the ball, yeah. and of course if he knocked the cover off the ball, I'm not going to take a, a, a resume of someone I've never met with a guy on the inside who's crushing it, right? That's right. But he didn't have the confidence in himself, and he wasn't willing to take a risk. And here's the thing. Here's the punchline. It was, this is a very long walk to get to a punchline is if you as a VC are not willing to take risk, how can you ever understand what it's like to walk in an entrepreneur's shoes? Hmm. That's why I told him no. Called me back three months later and asked for the job, and I told him no again. What's he doing now? I have no idea. That's a great story. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. You can said, laugh all you said, want. Said deadpan. <laughs> Look, to be an entrepreneur is about willingness to accept risk. Yeah. Too many people are, well, I, I, I want to quit my job at Microsoft, but it pays me 180 grand a year, and I'll quit if you'll fund me. Yeah. I mean, you have absolutely no self-confidence to take that risk in yourself. Why should I take a risk on you? Yeah. Yeah, take the risk, and then go out and get the work done, and go Go work your butt off and make it happen. I mean, that guy, if he had done that, where would he be? If he had done a great job, where could he be today? I think he would be at GRP, probably. <laughs> my, my guess. Um, okay, so so I've got some of these qualities of an invest entrepreneur. I've got the foundation okay. all right, for my ride-sharing service, which is going to change the world. Um, 
what comes first? Does the entrepreneur come first? Does the product come first? And what I mean by that is, like, if I say, I've got this great idea, does that make me an entrepreneur? Or, or do I then have to go out and actually make it happen before I should really call myself an entrepreneur? Well, um, if you'll allow me, um, I'll answer two questions, one that you didn't ask, but I think that you're implying, um, or maybe you're not implying, maybe I just want to answer it. But um, I've had this debate so many times whether entrepreneurs are born or made whether it's nature or nurture. And of course, it's a subjective question with no answer, but I have my opinion. Won't surprise you. Um, I think entrepreneurs are born. And I think your mind is wired in certain ways. We see children and we say, that person is musically gifted. She just has a right brain that just, she can do what other people yeah. can't do. She's musical. That kid mm. is good at sports. He was just a natural. That guy was just good at mathematics. I think all of our brains are wired in a certain way. And of course, you can be better at anything. So 10,000 hours of basketball, you can shoot really well, but this kid ain't ever going to dunk a ball, right? So right. there's certain physical limitations to how we're wired. And when I look at these skill sets of leadership, being self-confident, being able to persuade other people against all rational reason to join your company and join your cause and take a lower salary than they could get elsewhere and to get the press and to, for people to give you money and, and for a competitor or a biz dev partners to do this, whatever you have to do, like that leadership trait, it's just not innate in everybody. And the willingness to accept risk, I, I have an older brother who just, they're in the headlights when it comes to risk. Mm. He's very good at other things, but he just can't accept risk. He's not wired that way. It's yeah. we. He's a year and a half older. We were raised together. Mm. Chemically, he's just not wired for risk. I, for whatever reason, was wired for risk, and um, and you know, ability to take vagueness and turn it into ideas. Ability to. Um, you know, have certain attention to detail. Like if I if I go through all the traits that I think it takes, or you know, the, the chutzpah, like the ability to kind of just push things a Make little bit happen. too far, yeah. but not not further. Um, I don't think everyone's born with that. And I see people in leadership roles who can't handle the stress. And I just think sometimes people aren't chemically wired for that. So. That isn't the question you asked, but I do believe that not everybody is made to be an entrepreneur or a CEO entrepreneur. And if you're not, there's no shame in that. It's not the world's greatest job. And so if your passion is marketing, if your passion is engineering, if your passion is selling, if your passion is whatever it is, but you don't necessarily want to have to do all those other things, there's no shame in that at yeah. all. Um, what was your question again? Uh, it, it was about. Was it close? Yeah, yeah, super close. Oh, um, what should I do? What comes first, the entrepreneur or the uh, idea? Or the product? So look. Well, I mean, you know, so you've got an entrepreneur. He probably he he or she may or may not have a job already. They're trying to get an idea off the ground. He or she uh, is trying to figure out when they should jump full speed. I think it's this idea of you know if, if I'm if I'm trying to get this idea of ride sharing off the ground, then. Do I jump out of the plane and make it happen? Do I, do I validate it first? Do I, you know, at what, what, what point do I say, hey, you know what, I'm an entrepreneur, is it, is it? Well, there's a few things bundled in that question. You know, if, um, if I go back to this idea of two thirds of the world's people are not as blessed as we are, um, not everybody's life circumstances allow them to live the archetypal, I quit my job and eat pizza That's every right. night. You know, they've got kids or responsibility or a totally. sick parent or whatever. Or and again, I think we always ascribe the Mark Zuckerberg, I stay up till three in the morning coding every night um, archetype on, on entrepreneurs. And not every entrepreneur is that. And I think that's okay. And we shouldn't hold ourselves up to that standard. Um, so I would say that um, if you're young, and I'm not saying you can't do it if you're old. Let's exclude that for a moment. But if you're young and, you've, and, you're, and you don't have a mortgage, maybe you're married, maybe you're not, you don't have kids, and you have a lifelong passion in your belly to try, mm. then you owe it to yourself to do it. 
to try. And if you fail, who gives a shit? Like, it, like 20 years ago, it mattered. You failed, you suck. But like today, like failure is okay. It really is in California. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> no, in all seriousness, failure is not tolerated in most places. It's not tolerated in Europe. It's not tolerated in South Korea. Um, you fail and, and you're kind of ostracized. I, I'm dead serious about that. And you owe it to yourself to try because failure is so easy these days. The options for a failed entrepreneur are immense. And so if you try and you fail, that's okay. You pick yourself back up and you go. But when you become 35 yeah. and you're married and you've got two kids and responsibility, I'm not saying don't do it, by the way. Um, I think three of the first six entrepreneurs I ever backed were in their 40s and had kids. Mm. So I'm definitely not ageist in that regard I just recently backed a woman who was 37 weeks pregnant with her third child. Um, so I think it's not about ageism. It's just harder. It's harder for men. It's harder for women. You have other responsibilities. So I'm just saying, like, if you're young and you have the passion to try, try. But it's not right for everybody. Sure. Let, let's talk about, so, I, so I'm going to do it. I'm going to jump. I'm going to build this product. I'm trying to figure out if I'm going to do it alone or not. Yeah. Am, am I going to, I have to build a team. I can't yeah. possibly do everything by myself. But let's talk about the good and the bad of co-founders. You, you have a great take on this whole thing. And, um, and I highly suggest people go, go read your post on this. But well, a lot of people we see, we see Sergey and Larry. We see uh, um, Larry and David. Chad Larry and, and Steve. David. Chad and Steve. Mark and Eduardo. <laughs> um. <laughs> So talk to us about what, you know, let's talk about the good things about having a co-founder. Um, shared risk, shared, what, 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 what is the good that you see from so, your... So um, what I think is that we have a few extreme successes that draw the wrong conclusions. Mm -hmm. So if you do want to read it on my blog, it's called The Co-Founder Mythology. And if you search that, you may find it. Um, the co-founder mythology is this. We know the... Larry and Sergey and David and Jerry stories. We know Steve. And Steve. Yeah. And, uh, and no, Steve and Chad. Oh, you're talking about YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, who's Steve? Apple. And Steve. Oh, yeah. I guess so. Uh, I guess it was. Yeah. I guess they were co founders. Um, I don't know what their equity split was. But like you have these archetypal, again, startup founders. Um, and we hold those up and we say that's the model. But the reality is, more often than not, it's a bad. Yeah. Not always, but more often than not. Why? Well, first of all, um, often co-founders didn't know each other all that well before they started. Mm. And you started a journey, and you think you're similar. And when things are going incredibly well, no big deal. But when you hit tough times is where you find out what your partner's really made of. Yeah. And... If you're 50-50 founders and you don't have the same risk tolerance, <clears throat> someone wants an exit, the other person doesn't. Someone is willing to have a high burn rate because they want to build something big and the other person wants to have a lower burn rate. Someone gets a dog, gets a wife, has a kid, loses interest, starts drinking too much. By the way, I've seen that a lot. Really? Starts, yeah, honestly. Um, starts drinking too much, starts traveling Someone loses confidence. Someone gets depressed. Depression. I've seen it a lot. And, um, and even people who have known each other since high school get like this. Hmm. And it just becomes unresolvable if you're joint co-founders. And nobody ever talks about that because people don't want to talk publicly about these failures. And I'd say it's more often the rule than the exception. So what I like to tell people is hire your co-founders hmm. if you're confident. Or be the co-founder who gets hired. Yeah. But hire your co-founders if you're confident. Why? So you talked about jumping out of a plane. I really believe that most entrepreneurs, people who want to do it, they only are willing to do it if they have two other people lined up on the cliff ready to jump at the same time as them. Hmm. Because it's so much easier to call your mom and say, yeah, we quit our jobs. Look at us. And... Uh, it's so much lonelier to be the one person who did it. Sure. But here's the weird thing. If you can do a business plan and good PowerPoint slides and uh, uh, get a few people excited, hire a couple guys who are willing to do front-end design and maybe some back-end of your product, 
raise a little angel money, just like the basics, then people will come join you for significantly less than 50%. Mm. And I never tell people to be ungenerous. You can give them 5%, 3%, 12%, 25%, 40%, 46%. I could name more numbers. But you could offer anything. It's not about the number. It's about the prenup. Mm. If you fall out of love, it's still your business. Yeah. And if they're not working out, you can still terminate. And if you hit a loggerhead, you can either choose to say, look, I want to do it my way. Or you can say, gosh, over all this time, I think I trust your judgment more. Let's do it your way. Hmm. But you have the right to make those choices. And you don't control that in a 50-50 or a 33-33. And by the way, most founders I know prefer to do three founders, right? Like, because there's much less risk if three of us. But here's the thing. I always say to people. Why is that? You, I don't know, like safety in numbers, really, honestly. And, and sometimes it works incredibly well. But here's the thing. You come to me and you're grinding me over whether I get 18% or 19%. And it's like a death match. But you gave away two-thirds of your company to these putzes you barely know, right, before you ever came to see me. It just makes no sense. And so most first-time entrepreneurs do it. Most second-time entrepreneurs start themselves. Not all. But people have really been through it. Like when I said this publicly, like a lot of people were like, you're full of shit. But uh, people who were there, they always say, thank you for saying that. Let's, let's talk about, we've got a few more minutes. Let's talk about building relationships. This is something that you just talked about today. Yeah. This idea of, of uh, giving without expectation. And, and, and you mentioned it too earlier in this experience with, you know, if an entrepreneur wants to show tenacity, you know, he would meet me in the parking lot, but he wouldn't meet you to pitch you. He met you, and he, off, and he did something that might help you. He brought a cool founder to you that's do, working on something interesting. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Talk, talk, to us about, um, talk to us about what is currently happening. How does this work, this culture of asking? Um, and, and talk about, in your kind of perfect world, what should this look like? How should we as entrepreneurs and so, as a community be? acting if you don't know robert cialdini you need to and if you don't know his book on influence you should buy it and even if it, you find it um unpleasant um in the sense that everyone doesn't want to everyone wants to think well i don't play games and i don't uh that's underhanded to know how people influence other people what like what Cialdini talks about is the psychology and science of what really influences people. Mm -hmm. And of course, like all of human nature, it's the opposite of what you think. And he just goes through methodically and explains things. And it's, he's a very good author. Um, one of the most powerful tools that there is is reciprocity. Um, if I show up at your office and I bring you this nice, whatever it is, bottle of wine, and I got it, it's a special edition from Napa. And Derek, I just want to say like, I got this for you because you wrote this blog post that was really inspired me, and I want you to have it. Nothing else, right? Uh, it shouldn't be, but now you feel obligated to me. Yeah. And you, Although I don't drink. Well, so it's for you to give to as a present to like someone that. else. Like um, Then they owe me. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, re-gifting uh, <laughs> can be powerful. That's great. Um, and I, I'm giving you a, a very simple example. Yeah. But, like, if someone went out of their way for to me... do something thoughtful. Something thoughtful. Yeah. Um, a handwritten note. I always email back when I get handwritten mm. notes. Always. 100% of the time. Wow. 100%. I put it right next to my keyboard, and I said, that person took the time to write me a handwritten note. I'm going to write a thank you. Hmm. Every time. Send me an email, not so much. Like... And not that I don't have good intention, I just get too many email. Yeah. Handwritten note, I always say thank you. That's and cool. it's it's the special things, it's the people who make a little bit more effort. It's the um sometimes I'm slow to write back, by the way. Someone, if they happen to be in the audience, someone sent me this big box of like drinks. I don't even know what it is, like soft drinks or something. Is uh, it like kind of sketchy? Oh, great. Or? I have no idea. And to me, I didn't feel the reciprocity feeling from that. By the way, they're probably great drinks or whatever, but I feel more like that's, that's marketing materials. That's, uh, that's uh, what do you call it, tchotchkes or something. Uh -huh. you know? um, and I'm not saying I want everyone to send me a bottle of whiskey. I don't. Um, I have 12 un 
drunk bottles of whiskey on my desk as it is. Um, I'm just saying, like, in life, not related to me, but just be thoughtful. And the thing about influence is when you help other people, they mentally think that's someone I owe. They don't think it externally. They just know. Yeah. And I hate owing people. I hate it. Jason Nazar, who I wrote about in my blog, called me up one night and said, I have tick tickets to the Lakers, and I want to take you. And so I went. It was fun. This is several years ago. It was a playoff game, or maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was right before the playoffs. And uh, I hated it. I hated it because I knew that I owed him tickets back. Hmm. And it's not, that I, it's not that I hated buying him tickets back or spending another night. I just, the period of time between when he took me and I took him, I just, I couldn't see him without feeling like I owed that guy. I have another guy who took me, this is a true story, he took me to game seven hmm. of the Lakers-Celtics game. Wow. I didn't even know him before that night. And <laughs> I Was he an entrepreneur? Yeah. I can tell you, if you want to take me cool. to game seven of, a, of or, a NBA on. finals, like that's a, you can influence me. Um, <laughs> I can be bought. Um, but this guy's asked for so many favors since then, and they're all... <laughs> <laughs> They're all little small things. By the way, it's a very successful entrepreneur. Yeah. Very successful entrepreneur. Uh, here's the true story. The true story is he invited his lawyer, and his lawyer was my lawyer at my startup, and he said to his lawyer, why don't you bring someone who you think would be interesting for me to meet? Hmm. And so he brought me, and that's how, I, that's how I got to go. So he didn't invite me directly, but he still brought me, and I still felt, I still felt obligated. It's game seven. <laughs> Lakers won, by the way. Uh, I think this whole thing falls into, you know, your what you've written about, you know, a line versus a dot. Maybe we can finish on this. Which sure. This has had a this has had a really big impact in in the way that I build relationships. And please explain to people. But it's this idea that, you know, you can't you can't just blip on a radar and you know, pretty women some some entrepreneur into success. You know, it's this. You look, you, it's, it's this relationship over time. It's, it's blips here. It's up sometimes. It's down sometimes. Tell us, tell us where that kind of that so, thought came from and, and what that is, and then we'll finish up. Let me say one last thing on the last topic as a bridge, which is it feels good to give. It feels better to give than to receive, and I'm not just being cheesy. When you do something nice for someone and you expect nothing in return, yeah. it, it feels good. Well, this is, and the, the, the other reason I'd say is this is, those are part of our core community values. I'd say anyone here, you know, who's here and saying, I, you know, I got to rush the stage or I, I got to do, you know, it's, if you, if you stop for a minute and take yourself out of the, the very difficult situation of being an entrepreneur and it's, you know, you're constantly thinking about yourself. It's like a very self-centered job almost, you know, yeah. and, and just, if you can stop for a second, and just say, you know what, I got to help this guy right next to me. And if you can do that, I, I've just found that it has such a huge impact. And, and do it in an authentic way. That's right. Like, again, I'll go back to Jason Nazar because he's very good at this. Um, he, very early on in getting to know him, he said, um, I'm having drinks with the founder of uh, LegalZoom, and I'd like you to meet him. Would you come? Hmm. And I'm like, yeah, I I'd love to meet the founder of LegalZoom. That sounds interesting. Sure. So I came. Uh, that That's what I mean by doing a favor. Like, he was probably doing both of us favors because that guy's like, sure, it'd be good to meet a VC or whatever. Um, and, and it's so easy to do. Yeah. Like you'd go that extra mile. So um, lines, not dots. Um, let me talk about... Um, Can I add one more thought to yeah. that before you mm -hmm. go to that? Sure, well, I would say, you know, we, as an example with us, I mean, I don't, I don't really know you very well, but yeah. I, I knew you loved Clayton Christensen. Uh -huh. And I knew, I knew that I could get Clayton... To come speak, yeah, and I just thought, man, you know, it's cool, man. That would be so cool if Mark could interview this guy, you know. And it, it was one of those things where, it just, uh, well, it was, it was everyone, everyone wins, right? Clayton wins, you win, we win. Yeah. But it was, it was this cool kind of moment. I thought, man, it, you know, it would be great for me to interview Clayton, yeah. But man, it would, it would mean so much more to you yeah. to interview him than it would to me. So you wrote me, you probably remember this, a very earnest email, and you said something along the lines of, I like your work. I know that you think very highly of Clay. Um, I could do that interview, but I think you'd do a better job. Would you consider doing it? And I thought, yeah, absolutely. So I have to take a trip to NorCal. Who cares? Gladly, with pleasure. 
And I went and did it, and we didn't know each other. Right. And I actually didn't know Startup Grind that well. And it was such a well-run event. Like, Thank you. great people there. You ran it so professionally. They had, you know, the green room area where, you know, we got to have some private chats with people but come out and also meet everybody else. And it was just really well done. And you sent a follow-up gift, which was very nice. And you, uh, you know, created video, which was really nice. Um, you did a really good job of that. And at the event, Sam was there. I think Sam's around here. And Sam said, got it. You know, would you come speak at Startup Grind in L.A.? <laughs> On the spot, I said, absolutely. Yeah. This was a great event, no problem. And and Sam and I had worked together a little bit in the past uh, in a previous engagement, and I always liked him and thought, yeah, that's someone, I, if I could help him out, I'd like to do that. And the cross-campus guys, like, I love that they're trying to do something for the LA community, so every chance I get to come support cross-campus, I want to do it. And so um, all these people, whether, like, you don't even have to do stuff for me, when people go out of their way to do stuff for the community, if I can help, I'm in. And I think it's great, and you did a great job. Let's end on that note. Let's give Mark a big round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. you for that coming. That was great. Yeah, I appreciate you. that. Oh. My mic. Are we, are we, do we have time for questions or no? What, what's our time like? So the question is about what makes me think a product or a business plan is good or bad. And I'll take both of those in sequence. The idea of a product, um, I'll go back to this idea of lines, not dots that we started talking about. First of all, I, I have an intuitive sense for whether products are well designed or not from a lifetime of working in the tech sector. So some of it is judgment. Uh, if you design software, build software, I'm always going to ask you to show me product, or almost always going to ask. So I want to see how it looks. Does it look modern? Is it intuitive? Is the user flow good? And I'll give you one tip for, for demoing software. I call it a day in the life. Most people, and by most, I mean 90 plus percent of people demo software saying, I have a feature that, that does this, and then I have a feature that does that, and then you upload a file, and then you do a link, and I'm like, yeah, but I don't give a shit about any of this. Like, why are you showing me this? And um, what I care about is saying, you know what? The average customer service rep who has to do their job does these three things. And this is why they waste a bunch of time. So we've designed the tools where the rep will call in and the rep will do this. Instead of logging into a trouble ticket system, they're getting the feed directly from Twitter. And instead of having five system open, they have one. Tell me what a day in the life of your user is like, and then I can understand the business value of what you're doing. But to the idea of lines, not dots, is I like to say, I, I like to say one of the most important attributes of a successful startup is ability to ship product. Because you can always tell the people who say, I'm going to ship, and they just they don't have a cadence of getting stuff out the door. So if I meet you and I see the product, I can judge it on that day, and it's either great or good or indifferent. And then I see you three months later or six months later, and we're sitting down, and I say, oh, let me see the product. And then I get a sense for how it's evolved, and, and the cadence of product development matters a lot. As for business plans, I care about people who have at least given some thought as to how they might make money, even if it's not detailed or you don't pursue that route in the end. I care that you've thought a bit about your cost structure and how that will evolve over time. And I care that the founder has attention to detail. You know, you know one of the funniest questions that people can't answer? Let's say you have a startup with five people. I'm going to tell you more than 50% can't answer this question. I'll say to them, how many people in your company? And they're like, well, let's see. There's Sue and Larry and Steve. And so about, about five. About five? How many people work in your fucking company? Earmuffs. Uh, but like attention to detail matters to me. Yeah, and that's like a very simple indication that this person is not attentive to detail. Yes. Are there other questions that you ask that, or that you just ask that one if they know that one? You're. No, it's just it's um it's not a trick question. Really. Get out. <laughs> How many engineers? About two. <laughs> what does LA have to do to level up as a tech city? 
What does LA have to do to level up as a tech city? I think LA is amongst the two or three best cities in the country um, for technology. And of course, Silicon Valley is in a league of all its own and will always be. Um, so I don't even find that a comparison. What bugged me for years and has started to change was when people said LA might catch up with New York. And I'm like, well, let's look at the facts. How many great IPO'd technology companies, 2,000 employees or more exist in New York? Zero. Okay, so now that we have that out of the way, let's talk about what else is, is unique and better about New York. Who invented monetization of the internet? Like how Google makes all of its money. Paid search invented in LA. When you look at how Google makes its second most amount of money, which is AdWords, was an acquisition they did of an LA company. Uh, Yelp, great company, public company, awesome. But that original concept came from LA, from City Search, Ticketmaster LA, uh, uh, Affiliate Networking LA, Lead Generation LA. LA knows how to make money. Uh, look at social networking, the first big, huge social network LA. So LA has not produced a winner, and that's a problem. By the way, we've produced many companies that have sold between 500 million to a billion and a half. We need a tentpole win. We need Amazon. We need AMD. We need Dell. We need Compaq. We need Microsoft or, of course, Google, Facebook, Cisco, any of those. And we need one of them to succeed and IPO. And there's a reason for that is the way that startups become successful is as follows. You get your first biz dev deal. And how do you get it? You get it because you used to work at that company and you know all the people and they want to offer you a deal. And you get your angel investors from that company. And because you have that biz dev deal and because you're the anointed one who used to work there, you can get VC money. So you've got biz dev partnership, you have your first revenue traction or your first consumer traction and your first money. And, and these tentpole companies breed lots of startups around them. MySpace created 11 startups in LA, 11 spinouts. And wow. uh, it would be nice if there, were, if there was a tentpole win here. But I will tell you, there's no tentpole win in New York. Um, so I feel like, LA and New York are very similar tech markets. We're both on the ascendancy. We're both doing incredibly well. We both have interesting companies. We both have lack of capital. We both have lack of product managers. We both struggle when we try to scale beyond maybe 100 or 200 engineers in one company. Hmm. Uh, New York has just been better marketed. And the reason I think LA has turned around is nothing to do with the ecosystem. We've just upped our marketing. Because having Science and having Launchpad and having Mucker and having Amplify, having Cross Campus, having a, a Start Engine, all these people creating more startups means that you have all these businesses going out and telling Silicon Valley and Boston and New York and the press and everyone all the interesting stuff going on. There's really not that much more going on in LA. Maybe, maybe 2x what was happening before, but not 10x. LA was pretty damn good in 2007 and 8 and 9, and we had a lot of interesting stuff, but the story is being told. So I think LA really is on the rise. And I'm going to say one last thing is video, I think, really will change a lot because the future of the internet will be video enabled. Uh, Americans watch 5.3 hours of television every day, and they read less than a half hour a day. By the way, Europeans are no different. Um, and uh, in case you're European, and, uh, and they read less than half hour a day. And if you accept the premise that we are not going to fundamentally change media consumption patterns, then you have to accept that the future of the internet is video. And there is nowhere else like LA that has writers and directors and makeup artists and post-production and animators and special effects people, uh, music and sound and staging and actors. Uh, costume designers. Uh, New York has a lot of those skills, but no one has it quite like LA. So if the future of the internet is video, and we have the skills here, if we can build the tech skills to support those industries, I think watch out. And what about, I mean, a lot of these big video companies that are here, 
they're all built on top of YouTube, right? Which is in Silicon Valley. So who, who among, I mean, you, you, you know, you, you maybe, you, you can only say certain things. You're, 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 uh, but who, who, who of these players do you think? Is it Maker, Machinima? You know, you've got these different guys. You've got Hulu down here. I mean, who, who, is there anyone that's emerging that can kind of lead the charge on that? Or that, are there, is there a temple company in video that you think? Maker. You think it's Maker? No, I'm just yeah. Kidding. Uh, I do think it's Maker, but sure. I'm an investor there, so I'm biased. I want them all to succeed. Full screen, machinima, big frame, taste made. Uh, who am I leaving out? Um, Zephyr, do you count that? Zephyr. Like, I want them all, thank you. I want them all to succeed. Uh, I want us to succeed more, but I want them all to succeed. But here's the thing is um, everyone focuses a little too much on the fact that YouTube is driving the ecosystem. YouTube is Walmart. And if you want to sell candy bars, you got a choice. Do you want to sell it on the corner shop where you can make nice margin but low volume, or are you going to sell in Walmart? And there's a the right answer to that. Yeah. Both. And um, what's unique about U YouTube is that's where all the viewers are. So my view is you go to YouTube, you build audience. If you never migrate that audience to owned and operated properties or to mobile, if you don't build up subscriber base, if you don't get email addresses, if you don't get social hooks, if you don't get people giving you the cell number where you can message them, <clears throat> then you don't have an asset. Yeah. For the first time in history, video producers have the ability to build a direct relationship with their audience. And I'll tell you, at Maker Studios, we have 250 million subscribers. We did 3.4 wow. billion video views last month. So YouTube's just fine for me for now. So uh, the question is, if you have a slightly more mature business making profit, and in this particular case, enterprise software, should you raise VC, debt, or some other kind of financing? And there is no right answer, uh, uh, at least not on the surface of hearing those facts. Let me say this to you. If you want a high growth business that you have the ambition to build something really big, there is no better funding option than venture, if that's what you want. And that's not the right answer for everybody. Um, if you take venture money, the requirement is you have got to go for rocket fuel type growth. And so know that that's an expectation. I'll tell you a story is I have a term sheet into a company right now. The company's been around for 13 years and never taken venture money. 13 years. And I said to the founder, um, I, I put the term sheet in almost two weeks ago. I said, take it as long as you want. You've taken 13 years, no rush. <laughs> and uh, um, this is a true story. And I said to him, just know one thing. I'm not a wuss. If you take money, I'm going to come in here and we're going to fight. And we're going to spar. And we're going to talk about how to get growth going. I want you to be 50 times bigger than you are today. And I'm going to challenge the way you do things, and I'm going to want to bring in staff. And, you know, I'm not going to run your business. And at the end of the day, I, I can spar, but you got to make the difficult decisions every day. But if you want to do things the same way you've done for the last 13 years, I'm the wrong guy. And frankly, you're better off to raise debt. There are a lot of people who I say, look, depends what your ambition is. If your ambition is to have $5 million in your pocket, free and clear, post-tax, and you have a mature business doing profit, the best answer might not be venture capital for you because there may be better ways to get growth in your revenue, earn dividends, which are lower tax rate, and every year put a little bit of cash in your pocket. You take venture capital, that isn't an option. Like You're not taking cash as dividends out and putting it in your pocket. I mean, there are other ways to get money as secondary stock sales and whatever. Um, but I think the starting point is, do you believe it can be a very large business? Do you believe you need to grow at an extreme rate? And the reason I tell people to take venture capital in that situation is I do see people, let's say you made a couple million bucks and you're running your own company. Entrepreneurs who don't have OPM, you know what OPM is? Other people's money. Um, if you don't have OPM, you're, 
you're not going to have the same risk tolerance as when you have, like if someone gives you $5 million, you still feel responsible, right. but you now know you're empowered to go try to build something bigger. So I find people, even wealthy people, not willing to take the same level of risk to create growth. And what I often say to people like you is I say, well, uh, do, are there two or three competitors that you think are going to grow really fast? Do you think this is an enormous market? Because if it is an enormous market, and you're right, and you don't grow that fast, you're going to get your ass kicked one day. So you could be like a kind of small lifestyle business, which is not pejorative. Remember, that might be able to put $5 million in your pocket. But for example, take Box and Dropbox. Uh, Box.net and Dropbox were created at the same time. Actually, I was created before Dropbox. Box.net was created at the same time as me. I sold my company to Salesforce. We all did the same thing. And at some point, there must have been 50 companies started at that time. And I bet 48 of them are like kind of smallish businesses. Hmm. If you find a market that's going to be enormous and you don't capitalize it and grow, and if it's a big market, someone else will. Hmm. And still I'll say just one more time, that can still be just fine for you because you can control your destiny and your work hours and your life and how much you put in your pocket. So I would start with that as the agenda. It is hard to raise venture debt unless you have venture capital. Because the reason people lend you money as venture debt providers like Silicon Valley Bank, Square One, Comerica, WTI, and a number of them, is they'll lend you $3 million, but they'll look me in the eye and say, you are going to write the next check, aren't you? Hmm. And so they're not really taking the same risk you think they're taking. They're taking the risk that I'm going to fund the next round. And so if I don't, then the next time one of my portfolio companies comes to them for a loan, they're like, yeah, Suster's the guy who screwed us out of three million bucks. Hmm. So I'm not going to get a lot of venture debt deals anymore. So that's why venture debt and venture capital often go hand in hand. Well, I brave the traffic because I believe that's the right answer. You did what, sorry? You say brave the traffic. Because I know the VC is the right answer. Great. Well, that's awesome. When the name of your company is? A Terra Prime. A Para Prime? A Terra. A Terra Prime. What do you do? You create like a platform where they can, that they can push their applications through Microsoft yep. Enterprise stuff. Okay. Great. Congrats. Thank you. We got a couple more. We done? Okay. I think we're done. Let's give Mark a big, huge round of applause again. Thank you for coming. <laughs>